Um, Lavinia, thank you so much for joining us. Look, uh, I don't want to take too much time given this little interruption here, but I do want to just set the table and, and mention, you know, that um, obviously Brazil several years ago discovered the pre-salt and uh, catapulted itself into the Latin America, if not the global oil and gas debate and discussion. And that was uh, well into the um, opening of the sector, which had held several bid rounds. And at this point, Brazil is second only to Venezuela in oil production in South America. So I think it's important to put that into context of our discussion today. And also, obviously, we're going to get into a little bit of what happened in October with the 13th bid round, which by most accounts was a disaster and, and, and uh, the fewest bids uh, in over a decade in terms of um, uh, companies offering uh, on the blocks tendered. So I think there's several pieces of that uh, that we'll get into. The local content issue, obviously, the unfolding scandal there in Brazil associated with the National Oil Company and uh, the variety of service companies. And of course, the economic backdrop uh, and, and the oil price on a global scale. So we're delighted to have this conversation. And we're especially happy to uh, be joined by Lavinia Orlando, who is the head of research at FGV Energia. And she's held that position for two years now. Before that, she was a professor at FGV, which is the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio de Janeiro, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And it's been around for a long time and, and has some uh, cutting edge research. We're happy that they've now created an energy program and Lavinia is head of research at that energy program. And she comes from a, a finance background, if I'm not mistaken, and so has a, a good way to look at these issues. And she's going to share with us today the results and recommendations of a report that GV Energia put together and launched uh, or presented publicly in October. And so we're happy to, to be able to continue this conversation on the oil sector and the outlook for the oil sector in Brazil and the results and, and analysis that FGV Energia has done as part of their uh, research paper or, or, or product uh, that they put out in October. So, Lavinia, hopefully uh, everything's working okay now on the audio, and uh, I think the visual looks just good. We've got your presentation. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks so much for sharing uh, your results and recommendations with us and your time this morning and afternoon in Brazil. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for attending the seminar. Um, so first I would like to thank the Institute of the, the Americas for this opportunity and especially Jeremy, Alexis and Diana for the help and support with the technical you know, issues uh, and tests. Um, so the idea here is, is to present some of the recent developments in the Brazilian oil sector and uh, discuss some of the challenges the industry faces for the future, particularly in 2016. Uh, I have a very short presentation. I'll try to leave enough time for the Q&A session. So I'll first um, present an overview of the industry and try to uh, uh, build a context on how we got here. Uh, after that, I'll discuss how the conditions have changed dramatically in the rest, recent past. So turning to a perfect storm and what is expected uh, in the foreseeable future. So finally, I'll bring my views and some of the views that we found in this uh, report that uh, Jeremy just mentioned, which, by the way, was a partnership between FGV and Accenture. Uh, and, and then what would be the next steps and in, 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 in how, what kind of challenges we, we will face to implement the needed reforms. So um, starting with the industry overview, so as you can see in this graph, uh, Brazilian oil reserves and production has been showing a very steady growth trend since the constitutional amendment that officially broke Petrobras monopoly over ENP activities in 1995. So this is an important landmark for the beginning of the uh, period of intense reforms in the oil and gas sector in Brazil. So what happens in 1997, the Congress enacted a new petroleum law which established the concession fiscal regime for the EMP activities in, in, in the country. So in the next year, the government started a sequence of very successful bid rounds, which happened basically uh, every year after 1998, as you can see in the graph. So that's when I put round zero until round 10. So every year we had a bid round. Um, the process of the bid rounds have evolved and some rules have been adjusted. 
along the way. But, but, but the process is quite serious and transparent uh, with the terms of the draft invitation to bid and the contract being discussed with the stakeholders uh, previously in public hearings and etc. Uh, so it's a quite well established process. Uh, on the other hand, there are some issues which I will discuss later and that's uh, some of the things uh, those issues could explain, you know, the result that we had in the 13th bid round which just happened in October the year. Um, so somewhere in, in 2006, the pre-salt were discovered. So uh, the pre-salt discovery was announced as a new frontier of exploration in Brazil with excellent prospects of reserves. So it's now known that the pre-salt was one of the largest, possibly the largest oil discovery in this century. And uh, according to the Ministry of Mining and Energy in Brazil, the three largest uh, oil discoveries in the world in the last 10 years happened in the pre-salt, which was the Lula, Buzius, and Libra field. So it was the beginning of the second mandate of President Lula. We were in the middle of a, uh, the super cycle of commodities, uh, very high oil prices, uh, strong GDP and income growth in the country. So uh, conditions were very favorable at the time. And after a few years, um, the government decided that you know, the pre salt was a very strategic asset for the country and that the, the exploration and production in the area should have a tighter control uh, from the government. So the idea, the idea was, you know, the pre salt is different, so we should treat the pre salt differently. Uh, and then uh, started, we started a very long political discussion in the Congress. Uh, about what should the fiscal regime in the pre-South and how should royalties be shared among the different states in Brazil. And then finally, in 2010, we, uh, the Congress enacted the uh, Partilha Law, which is the law that established that in the pre-South areas, the fiscal regime should be a production sharing regime. Uh, only uh, the Brazilian production sharing uh, um, regime has some peculiarities which I will uh, detail later. Uh, so in this new regime, um, well actually I'll, I'll talk about it now. So in this new regime, what we have is uh, Petrobras has to have at least 30% uh, in any pre-salt area. Petrobras has to be the operator and the sole operator in the area. And also a new uh, state company called PPSA uh, was created to represent the federal government interest uh, with power to intervene in the development plan and, and, and this state company should be carried by the other uh, companies that participated in the, uh, in the venture, in the pre -sale. So, um, in 2013 we have the first pre salt bid, uh, Libra, with only one consortium bidding in the auction. And in 2014, we resumed the bid rounds for the other areas, still under concession regime, with this uh, 12th uh, bid round. So in October this year, we had the 13th bid round. So you, as you can see in the graph, we spent uh, roughly five years without offering any areas for ENP, uh, basically due to the discussions uh, rega regarding the pre-salt. In the meantime, uh, shale production uh, in the U.S. was uh, was pacing up quickly and then the, the discussion on climate change was becoming more intense and we, we just have had a window of five years that we basically lost without having any bid rounds. Okay, so what happens is, uh, in summary, in the period 2003-2014, to we had a conjunction of good news. So we have a very positive macro scenario in Brazil. We had high oil prices. Uh, we had a pre-South discovery. And uh, Petrobras was in a very strong position, both strategically and uh, financially well, with very good access uh, to financing. Well, the problem is that these excellent news somehow turned into very questionable uh, decisions, just to put it mildly. Um, the first decision was uh, 
Petrobras investment plan, which became quite bold with annual investments reaching as high as $45 billion, which is the highest uh, uh, in, among the oil industry uh, globally. Uh, this investment would support the achievement of a very, very aggressive production target of 4.9 million barrels per day by 2020. Uh, just as an example, uh, current oil production is around 2.2, so it was a very aggressive production target. The other point is, uh, was the increase in local content requirements, which became a very important tool for the government, uh, for industrial policy uh, for the government. So the idea was use the local content requirement as industrial policy and uh, job creation uh, uh, for job creation in the country. And, and the basic idea behind the local content was whatever could be produced in Brazil should be produced in Brazil without uh, prioritizing sectors where the country already had some expertise, such as subsea equipment. So soon enough, uh, what happened was that the, the, the supply chain had to deal with some bottlenecks, such as the low qualification of the workforce. Uh, and this led to some delays in production uh, and increased costs for, for the companies, the operators here. And also, uh, the new co uh, local content rules were uh, quite complex and required uh, very intense monitoring. Uh, the other two points um, were, you know, the new regulation that established the production sharing regime, uh, which uh, increased uh, regulatory uncertainty and the government, government intervention in Brazil. And it also incre increased the, whole, uh, the role of uh, Petrobras in the sector. So this was actually uh, an inflection point to the trend of increased participation of other, of other players, which started in 1995 uh, with the constitutional amendment, um, the one that broke uh, Petrobras monopoly. So all these decisions uh, made uh, the Brazilian oil uh, sector uh, less attractive to foreign investors. So on one side, we had an amazing uh, geological condition with a pre-salt, but on the other hand, the level of uncertainty and above-the-ground risks were very difficult to deal with and to measure. So in any case, we had five years without bid rounds, which proved to be an immense mistake. Uh, so when bid rounds were resumed, the attention of the global industry had turned to other issues, such as the shale production in the U.S. Now, uh, um, hold on a second. In the next slide, um, what I show is what is the uh, Brazilian oil sector uh, now. Uh, and the figures I have here are 2014 year end. So Brazilian sector today has some 10 billion barrels of oil. Uh, I'm talking only about oil now. Uh, most of it, 95% of it, offshore. Our production is at 2.3 million barrels per day, mainly offshore as well. Our refining capacity is 0.2 million barrels per day, and it's owned basically by Petrobras, the whole uh, refining capacity. And, and as a matter of fact, most of the oil production 86% comes from Petrobras. So I did not include in the figures the gas sector, but most of the national gas production comes associated gas, which means that most of the gas is also produced by Petrobras. Actually, it's 81% uh, of national production last year. And Petrobras imports gas from Bolivia and owns the three existing uh, LNG regas terminals. And in the past three years, Petrobras has been importing large uh, volumes of LNG to supply the electricity generation uh, in the country. So finally, uh, Petrobras also owns uh, the totality of the transportation, gas transportation pipelines in Brazil and also has participation in nearly all gas uh, uh, distribution companies except for uh, two, or, two or three companies. So just as in the oil sector, Petrobras has a very dominant position in the gas sector as well. One important point um, I would like to mention uh, is reflected in this uh, uh, graph here, you know, in the lower graph in the left, which shows the evolution of uh, production in the pre-South, which is the blue bar that is increasing uh, starting in 2008. In, in, in eight. 
Um, as you can see, the pre-salt production is increasing very fast, uh, which is great news. Uh, so pre-salt share uh, in the total production is increasing fast. The graph is a little bit misleading because it might seem that the, uh, the post-salt production has been decreasing sharply, with, which is not the case. But uh, with ups and downs, what happened is the post-salt production increased only 8% uh, in the whole period between 2005 and 2014. So actually, there's a, a, um, a flat production um, in, in the post-South area, and the pre-South is uh, supposed to be, uh, you know, compensating for the future lack, uh, uh, loss of the decline of production that we are expecting to see in the post-South. Um, and the point is, that's why, you know, the, the investments in developing the pre-south is, is quite important because there's, there's an expectation that an eventual depletion of the post-south area should be replaced by the promising increase in the production of the pre-south. Okay, uh, so now let's see what, uh, what happened to the situation and how this has changed. So the situation has... Uh, deteriorated uh, very rapidly in the last in the past two years so on the macro side we saw uh, the deceleration in demand growth in some regions uh, we saw a strong deterioration of the macroeconomic fundamentals in Brazil we, we've seen increasing um, lack of confidence uh, resulting in strong devaluation of the real the Brazilian real increasing unemployment rates and the downgrade of Brazil by rating agencies. Um, on on industry-specific issues, either locally or globally, we have seen, as you know, a sharp decline in oil prices and also Petrobras financial distress, uh, which was partially due to bad management decisions and to the high level of government intervention, and in part because of the recent uh, corrupt, corruption scandals. So. It's important to mention that uh, due to the dominant position of Petrobras in the, uh, in the industry in Brazil, whatever affects Petrobras will pass through to the whole supply chain. So we have seen several business closures and layoffs in the industry in Brazil. Uh, so the publication that uh, Jeremy just mentioned is this one uh, on the top of the page. Uh, where we interviewed industry leaders, regulators, academics, government officials to discuss this situation uh, in the oil sector and, and to uh, discuss which would be the possible way out. So this is a partnership uh, between FGV and EG and Accenture. So based on that, uh, the way we see the short-term future has uh, basically two key variables that have major impact in the oil industry in Brazil. So I will discuss them and we will see where is possible to act and where we're just takers and we can do nothing about. Well, the first point is obviously oil prices, uh, global oil prices. So as most of you know, uh, the expectation here is of a slow recovery. The graph up to the right shows the difference in oil price uh, uh, projections in May um, 2015, which is the blue line and September 15, which is the red line. Uh, so this is showing that, that uh, projections are quite bearish, so the, the recovery should be slow. And uh, what this means is that companies will increase capital discipline and continue to make efforts to further reduce costs. They will focus, focus on the uh, most strategic assets, the ones with better returns, uh, in order to strengthen cash flow. And, um, and, and for Brazil, it's important to mention that we are competing with other regions for investments. And in this low oil prices scenario, it might not be enough to have a great geological asset as the pre-south is. But the point is, there's not, there's not much we can do about oil prices so, uh, directly. So all we can do is prepare for difficult times ahead in terms of oil prices. Now, uh, in the next slide, I talk, um, I put up some figures about the Brazilian macro-political scenario. So, I have put together some figures of the most recent estimates for next year, uh, released only yesterday 
by FGV's macro team at IBRI. Um, so as you can see, next year will not be an easy one. The macro team is expecting a GDP decrease of 3% next year after a 3.6% decrease this year. 2010 was flat in terms of GDP growth. So this means that we are entering in the third year of reduced economic activity. Household, household assumption is expected to fall 3.2% year on year in 2016. And uh, what I think is the most important uh, point here is that uh, unemployment rates should reach on average 1.7% next year. Those are all estimates, okay? Um, and, and it shows an increasing trend over the quarters. Uh, my view is that uh, this means that the crisis, the economic crisis in Brazil, has not reached the, uh, the streets yet. So the industry have cut uh, the industry as a whole, not only the oil industry, but the industry have already cut job positions in 2015. But part of this workforce was being absorbed by less formal jobs in the retail and service sectors. The expectation now is that the retail and service sector will stop hiring and eventually they will start to reduce job positions. On the political side, the situation is already uh, highly uncertain and turbulent and uh, a further deterioration in the, econo in the, in the economy uh, should make the population even more unsatisfied with the government. I know some of you might, be asked, might want to ask me about the likelihood of the impeachment process, uh, how this is going to go. Uh, so I might as well just answer in advance. I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. So it's, it's very uncertain. And uh, um, I'm not a political analyst, but I doubt any political analyst would know an answer for that. So um, what, what we can do is, is hope that this, uh, sh uh, this situation is resolved uh, 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 quickly because uh, nothing happens and uh, what we see is um, a paralysis in, in, in the country while uh, you know, the political situation is not resolved. Uh, the, the key points here, uh, though, are number one, a decrease in economic activity should mean lower demand for oil products. And I'll, I'll tell you uh, shortly why this is even more important for, for Petrobras than it might seem at, at first sight. And number two, the political instability creates a very challenging environment for implementing the necessary reforms, both fiscal reforms and reforms in the oil sector. Uh, well, about Petrobras, um, which is the, th the third important variable that um, we, we're going to talk about, uh, and this is one variable that we can uh, at least uh, try to act on and to uh, improve uh, in order to uh, uh, um, uh, try to uh, uh, make the oil sector in Brazil recover uh, quickly, quicker. Uh, just a quick review of, on what happened on Petrobras in the recent past. The company had some $20 billion write-offs in the beginning of this year uh, due to asset impairments or due to uh, overpayments incorrectly capitalized. So this last part is uh, refers to the cor corruption scandals. Uh, as a recovery plan, the new board of the company was appointed earlier this year and the company released a revised investment plan plus a divest divestment strategy. So the main target of the new plan was to decrease net leverage below 40% and three times the bid by uh, 2018. Uh, the company also revised its projected capex, showing a 37% reduction compared to previous estimates, uh, together with a downward revision of production. Uh, they revised production targets from 4.2 million barrels per day in 2020 to 2. 0.8 million barrels per day then. Uh, and also the plan some $15 billion uh, asset divestment for the 2015 and 16 period. 
Well, uh, what happened uh, is that the actual achievements were much lower than expected. Uh, third quarter results this year showed net debt at 5.2 times EBITDA. Um, the company is having also a huge uh, difficulty in accessing the capital markets after the downgrade. So in September this year, for example, the company unsuccessfully tried to issue 3 billion reais, which is about um, $800 million in the venture in the domestic market, and this just not, didn't happen. The rate offered was higher than, actually, than the rate that uh, Vali, sorry, was <coughs> second. So the rate offering that the venture placement was higher than the rate that Vali, the company Vali, uh, offers for their debentures, and it was less one success Petrobras. Um, also, out of the fifteen billion dollar divestment plan for uh, two thousand fifteen and sixteen, only about one billion was achieved leaving the remainder for 2016. Uh, this was well below the target, and the reason might be that the controlling shareholder insists in selling minority stakes. Uh, so now let's get back to the economic activity, uh, and let's explain why this, is, uh, this slowdown in economic, uh, economic activity is quite important for Petrobras. So this will mean lower demand for oil products, and for Petrobras, because domestic oil product prices kept above international prices in order to help the company to build uh, cash flow, uh, what will happen is this will affect even more Petrobras. Uh, this uh, um, domestic oil uh, product prices above international prices has been a positive collateral effect of lower oil prices. Not only would we uh, the, country, uh, the company was able to uh, reduce subsidies, but also we were able to uh, put prices a little bit higher in order to help Petrobras to recover cash flow. Um, so um, the other thing is there's still intervention in the company, which limits the possible actions uh, that the new board can take. What seems to, be, to have been achieved so far is a stop loss. So uh, the new administration is, is, is being, has been able to stop all the losses uh, in the company, but there's so much more to be done. So as in the case of the oil prices, the recovery in the case of Petrobras is, is going to be very, very slow. Um, so what we talked about now is um, we talked about oil prices. There's nothing we can do. We talked about the macro and political situation. Well, um, not much we can do, but um, there's some room for improvements, but depends on the political scenario. And on Petrobras, there's uh, a little bit uh, more room to uh, um, improvements, but um, what, what you know, the results have been showing us is that you know, this, this recovery is, is happening at a, at a very slow pace. So my, my last slide, uh, and I believe summarizes our, what I think is our only way out. The main variable uh, that I think uh, we have some degree of control of, on is, uh, and that we can use in our favor is uh, the rules and regulations in the oil sector. Um, the point here is that we need to attract investments. Um, and this need to this necessity to attract investments could trigger some of the imperative reforms in the sector. The first one would be uh, our production sharing agreement. And as I, I mentioned, you know, we have very particular future features in uh, in our our production sharing agreement. So um, we used to call it in Brazil our jabuticaba because jabuticaba is a fruit that allegedly we only have in Brazil. So we used to say that you know the kind of production sharing rules, agreement rules that we have here, we only have in Brazil. Um, there is already an amendment to the law. Uh, it's being proposed by an opposition senator, and uh, the proposed change uh, is uh, eliminate the sole operator clause which means that not only Petrobras 
uh, can be the operator in the pre-salt area, and also uh, eliminate the mandatory participation of Petrobras. It is still to be voted. Uh, I personally think that is well, the year is about to end, so I don't think it's going to happen this year. Uh, hopefully in first quarter next year, but also it depends on the political scenario. Second thing, uh, we must revisit our very stringent local content rules. Uh, for the contracts already signed, uh, there are millions of dollars in fines to companies for not complying with these rules, and this has to be discussed. Uh, for future contracts, we should define our priorities in terms of uh, industrial policy and focus on segments where Brazil has some comparative advantage. Uh, rules have to be simpler and uh, uh, the local con content should not be a bid parameter as it is today. Uh, also, uh, it is quite important that uh, the government and the regulator improve communication with the industry. As I mentioned previously, and as Jeremy mentioned as well, the bid round process is quite uh, transparent and robust, uh, so the stakeholders can propose improvements to the draft contract and to the draft invitation to bid in public hearings. However, what happened is in the 13th bid round, uh, that happened in OPA. Uh, most of the industry demands were not accepted by the regulator. So no wonder only 37 out of the 266 blocks offered were sold. Uh, so the results were uh, well below the expectation, even the worst expectations in the country. So finally, uh, we must have a, a frequent and uh, predictable calendar of bid rounds, and it has to be publicized in advance to investors. So we already lost uh, five years without bid rounds, and, uh, and uh, we should have a better planning uh, of those bid rounds and, uh, and put Brazil back again in the agenda uh, of internet investors. So in summary, um, what I wanted to, uh, to leave as a message is that we do have a world-class asset, you know, the pre-salt has been showing very strong productivity um, and, and um, of course there are some geological uncertainties but, you know, the results have been quite positive. Uh, but this is not enough, so this is not enough to attract investments. Uh, we need to have a stable and transparent rule. Uh, we are competing for financial resources with other countries and other regions in the globe. So, uh, in the scenario of very low uh, oil prices, uh, investors will choose carefully where to invest. So, uh, the opportunity we have is to make, um, you know, the rules and the regulation uh, uh, more friendly, transparent and friendly to investors. Um, so, this, this was my main message. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Um, I hope I didn't speak too much. And I'm happy to take questions at this point. So, Jeremy? Thank you, Lavinia, so much. That was very uh, comprehensive, and I think we have a lot of material there to talk about. Um, just a reminder to everyone, on the um, left-hand side, bottom of the screen, you have the main chat function, and uh, that's where you can post your questions that I will uh, get to Lavinia and we'll have a conversation now um, based upon her analysis and this uh, very interesting uh, diagnostic, but also the recommendations. But I have to say, Lavinia, I'm very disappointed because the number one question I wanted to ask you was about the impeachment process. <laughs> and I was really looking forward to starting our conversation in the question and answer session with that. But, uh, oh well, <laughs> I guess we'll have to skip that one. Um, but I mean, jo joking aside, I think you did answer that. And I think the the um, uncertainty it lends to the the macro political and, and frankly the macroeconomics in in Brazil are are not to be uh, underestimated. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the point is about the you know about the impeachment. It's exciting because I hear some you know some friends and colleagues here, and we talk over lunch, and people say things like, "Oh, did you see did you see the news yesterday?" And if someone says no. That means that he doesn't have a clue of what's happening because it's changed so fast. Mm -hmm. And you, 
if you're not very, you know, if you don't pay very close attention, you just, you know, just you just lose it. You just don't understand what's happening because there's so many rules and so many, you know, uh, uh, things happening at the same time, and, and that you just don't understand what's happening and who is who, you know. So yeah, it's quite confusing. No, very. As you said, <laughs> political analysts don't know what's going to happen. So. Great. So we'll jump we'll jump from that into uh, stuff that you can specifically uh, address. And so uh, there's some questions po folks are posting. Let me let me throw one I wanted to and something we've talked about before when you participate with us at the roundtable. The, mm -hmm. the so obviously the oil price is a, was a huge issue for round 13. But so it's a two part question about round 13. What was the number one issue that you felt? caused it to be so unsuccessful taking you know not including the oil price issue what was the number one issue and i guess you know we've talked a lot about what's going on in mexico and in between uh biddings in mexico there's been a strong effort to uh adjust some of the terms and the way the contracts and, and the way the the terms are written and 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 dealt with um so what are the lessons and, and are those lessons being received by the government so two parts one is what was the number one issue that made it so unsuccessful that the, the round 13 and then you know are the lessons from that round being heard in Brasilia and, and at the government and regulator level well I, I think I would say that um, I have two uh, two factors that I think could explain quite uh, well you know uh, the, the results of the 13th bid number one uh, the one I just mentioned was you know the the rules uh, I know that, uh, you know, in the public hearing, I was there, I've heard, you know, people from the industry uh, uh, making lots of recommendations for changes, and the uh, one of them was that the uh, local content uh, should not be a bid parameter. And uh, most of their demands were not addressed, you see. Uh, so this is one thing. I mean, the, the regulation is not, is not really... Uh, stable, so it might. Uh, I think investors fear that um, rules might change, you know. Uh, and the other thing is, um, they are not too friendly to investors, you know. So there's one thing, and the other thing is, well, in uh, the way I think the um, oil price might have affected, you know, the the interest is is quite indirect. So what I think is because companies are focusing in very, um, um, uh, very uh, how do you say, very specific assets, the most uh, profitable assets, I think the quality of the areas that was uh, um, you know, made available at the bid round might not be you know, the kind of area that the companies are looking for at this point. So I think... Uh, if the if oil prices were higher, then I think companies would have room to uh, to to find some you know areas other than you know deep water pre south very productive areas you know uh, so the quality of the areas the areas are, um, um, available for 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 the thirteenth bid rounds I think uh, I don't think in this scenario of oil prices they were attractive. So, uh, and and the other thing is you 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 mentioned I'm sorry it, you mentioned whether I think this is being heard yes um uh, that's a tricky question uh, I, I I sometimes um, confuse myself in what I really think and what I wish for so <laughs> I wish it is <laughs> and uh, but uh, I don't see um. I don't see people actually not even in Petrobras, you know, the situation of the company. I don't. I don't think you know the real situation is sinking in. You know, I don't, I don't think people have fully understood uh, how how you know how bad the situation it is and can become. So what I think is reality is gonna knock on people's door eventually, uh, and I think it will be soon. And when that happens, and I, I think uh, next year uh, probably uh, it's going to be a very difficult year. I think you know the government is going to see that they have to uh, pass the reforms, they have to change the Patilia law, 
uh, they have to, uh, uh, to discuss local content. So I think eventually it will sink in, you know, the message, but, but I, I don't see it. I think it's, it's kind of building up is very slowly. <laughs> So, so let's. There's a there's a very specific question somebody has posted here, uh, just to take this discussion a little bit further. And the question is, what, in your opinion, is the likelihood of any of the of your proposed reforms in terms of the operatorship, the local content, the regulatory environment, predictable bid rounds, any of that being enacted prior to the end of Joma's administration? Okay. Uh, so uh, the first uncertainty here uh, is what is what would be the end of Dilma's administration? So I will I will respond to that, considering 2018 as the end of Dilma's administration. So um, having said that, what I think is I think it is likely uh, that this uh, at least part of the reforms will pass. I think specifically, uh, you know, the the PSA uh, law amendment. I think this has a good chance of passing. And I, the reason I think that is because, well, uh, we have a very, um, very cautious fiscal situation and we have, we have a very, you know, cautious, you know, financial si situation for Petrobras. So Petrobras probably will not be able to uh, make new investments uh, in the very short terms, and in the very short term, I mean the next two years, in the pre-salt. So the pre-salt uh, might be a very good opportunity for the government to um, to have, you know, investments, uh, foreign investments in, in, in the next two or three years, which is going to be very important for the fiscal situation. So I think, you know, the, the macroeconomic uh, situation is going to be a very important trigger, okay? So I think it's it's likely that uh, this amendment will pass, you know, uh, in the near future. Future. So I would say, um, you know, setting apart, you know, the the turbulence about the impeachment and everything, I would say that we would have a good chance of having this passed next year. And and that's the amendment that would remove the, the sole operatorship, correct? Yeah, it it will it would. Um, uh, make some changes. The one is the sole operator clause, which would mean that Petrobras uh, would not need to be the only operator in the pre-sale. And uh, the, the, the minimum of 30% uh, participation of Petrobras, all of this would go right. away. So, so here's a couple, that, let's get into little, some specific questions here and then we can come back because I want to talk a little bit about Petrobras as well. Um, so uh, somebody's asked a question. I think it was your slide seven. You had some oil price outlooks, and the question mm -hmm. was, um, what happens in the second half of 2016 to that affects the Brent price so much? So mm. I don't know if you can. Oh, uh, this um, I have to say, this is this, those are some projections that I got from. Uh, uh, I have the source here, so I just I'm just looking for it. So those are estimates. What I wanted to show here is how estimates have become uh, much um, um, bearish, you know, uh, from May to September. So the curve we have for May shows a, a, a trend, a different trend, and a, a more positive trend for the, uh, the oil prices. Yeah, you see? So, uh, you know, the May projection, what you see is a positive trend um, a more positive trend for the uh, oil price. So in September, you know, the estimates were revised and you see that you have lower oil prices um, uh, than you had in May, uh, projected at, than you had in May. So what happens is, I think people kind of understood that, you know, the low oil prices were not just something that happened for two or three months and prices would recover. So I think uh, uh, some companies are seeing that the prices might remain in the 50s range uh, for next year, for example. So they have to prepare for that. So that's the point. Okay. So, so, um, so then let's. There's another question here that's interesting. Uh, uh, it's a very specific question. If you'll bear with the, uh, it's about 
importation of diesel. There's somebody uh, participating today from a company, in, a diesel company in Houston, who wants to know about the opportunities to sell diesel and other fuels to Brazil, and um, anything you can talk about in terms of, of you know, importation of, of refined product, diesel, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I see the question. Well, uh, the point is, um, we have, you know, uh, what we do in terms of oil products is we export some oil products and we import a different, um, you know, best of oil products. So, um, I don't, don't see any specific reason why we don't. I, I don't know of any regulation that says we cannot import diesel because we do uh, import different kinds of oil products to have uh, according to the mix that we need here. Okay, um, so uh, I don't know if the question is whether there is a, a, a specific regulation forbidding that, and I don't know of any such regulation. Um, uh, one of the things uh, I would, you know, uh, think about when I, I, I read something like that is the fact that, you know, with, with the COP21 or the Paris, uh, you know, agreement, uh, we have a very uh, big biofuse program and I think uh, if Brazil, and I think Brazil is serious about the target, uh, I think we will see an increase in the biofuse sector. Uh, a growth in the biofuel sector uh, in the future. So, um, well, we might see, you know, some competition between, you know, oil products and gas for transportation and uh, biofuels uh, in the transportation sector in Brazil in the future. Okay, okay. You know, obviously, Brazil has a long history since the 70s on, uh, you know, federal biofuels or alcohol, right, as, a, yeah. as you call it. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, so a um, couple, couple other questions um, that did get more, and, and I want to, we'll end with some little discussion on Petrobras, but uh, there's a question about, if I understand this correctly, the, um, I, I think somebody is trying to understand the cost of production, the differential between pre-salt and, and what your graph talked about, post-salt, and what that means mm -hmm. in terms of uh, impact in terms of Brazil, Brazil and the lower price of oil for Brazil's um, financial equilibrium is what they see here. Hopefully, maybe you can explain uh -huh. a little bit the difference, differential in cost of production and what that means in terms of Brazilian economy, especially in the low price environment. Okay, so the first thing I, I'd like to clarify is that, you know, the, the, the oil sector is a big thing in Brazil, but it's quite different from uh, Venezuela, for example. Uh, Brazil is, uh, the fiscal um, accounts in Brazil are not too dependent on the oil sector. Obviously, it affects because it's a big sector in Brazil, but it's not uh, the same case as other uh, producing countries or exporting or OPEC countries where, you know, the fiscal break-even of the oil price is quite important. So that's not the case in Brazil. It does affect the fiscal uh, accounts in Brazil, but it's not uh, quite as bad as in other countries. That's one thing. Um, the other thing about the pre-salt is, well, uh, from what I, I talk to the people, you know, in the industry, what is happening, uh, the pre-salt is, is, is showing to be very productive. So the, uh, the most, uh, uh, the greatest production, uh, product, uh, producing well in Brazil, the most productive is, is already a pre-salt um, well. It's in, in Libra, okay? So the production is, is quite, um, is, is, is showing to be more positive, the level of production than people expected before. And on the cost side, uh, also what I have, uh, as a, a figure from, from the people in the industry, is that costs are better than they expected. So I've heard figures around uh, uh, the pre-salt holding production at any price above $40. So at $40 would be a break-even price for pre-salt. Wow. Uh, well, of course, there's lots of geological uncertainty, so it's, uh, we still need lots of investment. And, uh, we don't know how you know the reservoir is going to behave. So, but at this point, you know the prospect is very positive for the pre-sale. Uh, the point about carrying the pre-sale with the um, uh, the poor salt, 
uh, area is that on the other hand, on the negative side, what I also hear is that the post salt area and the, the campus basin is showing a stronger decline in production than expected. So this means uh, that the, uh, the, the, the investment in, in the pre salt is going to be key to maintain the level of production and mm. to keep increasing production in the future. So, so that's actually some positive news because at one point, you know, the projections project, projections for pre-salt production seemed wildly uh, unrealistic and out of line. But, but to your mm -hmm. point, maybe things are going a little bit better than, uh, as you dig into the details, maybe things are a little bit better than, than seems to be from the, from the outside. Yeah, that's, and that's actually what we have been hearing from the industry. I mean, not mm -hmm. only for Petrobras, but for other people, from other people in the industry. People are really, uh, you know, having a p very positive view of the pre-salt and, and things are better than expected. So, so this is that's a perfect segue to to another question here. Uh, how does low oil prices impact the development of fields where Petrobras is the leader of the consortium, such as Libra? So, how does uh, talk a little bit about that? I think we've been talking about that. So now, be specific about say, you know, one of the the, the, the Libra, which is the one field that was tendered to a consortium. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, the thing about, you know, the development of Libra is that uh, I think the main point uh, about how uh, Petrobras is going to develop Libra is the fact that Petrobras is having so many difficulties in accessing the capital markets, you know. Uh, you know, the kind of, of operations they are having now are very, you know, commercial operations such as, you know, uh, leasing of some platforms and um, um, uh, export financing. So I think uh, what is hard is that the company is very, very leveraged right now. Uh, the company is very focused in, um, in uh, you know, reinventing itself and uh, kind of reshaping what would be the strategic plan for the company and trying to divest from some assets. Um, and, and, and it's been so difficult to uh, access uh, capital markets. So if, if, for example, if we see a, better, a worse situation in Brazil next year, let's say, uh, I hope, um, you know, nothing happens, but uh, let's say something happens, you know, uh, to Brazil in terms of uh, downgrading, a further downgrade uh, in the rating. So. Uh, let's hope it's not happened, but if it does, it's going to be even harder, you know, and, and we, we already discussed, you know, the macro situation in the country, uh, which is, you know, it's not going to be easy next year. So uh, I think the most, what is most difficult for Petrobras at this point is how uh, the company is going to uh, um, um, uh, finance itself or finance, you know, the investments in the future. That that's a perfect. I mean, it, it it's a perfect segue from this question into some a couple of things I wanted to wrap up with, which is you know we haven't we've talked about Petrobras, but we haven't talked about some of these key issues. So uh, I think it was last week there were rumors flying that as part of the asset um, sale in 2016, Libra, this this project in this field we we're just talking about, was going to perhaps be divested by the company. Um, but more, let, let's talk more broadly about there's there's a massive, I think it's $15 billion of assets that are, are going to be sold and divested by the company in 2016, right? So talk about that, you know, how is that going to play out? And will that be enough? I mean, because I, I think this is one of the questions that I have even more now listening to you discuss, you know, we have the downgrade issue and then the, 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 the effort to place, you know, and, and all of these financial hurdles. Is 16 or 15 billion of assets sales enough to keep the company going, especially in the, in, in the pre-salt and what the commitments are? It, it might not be. It might not be. Uh, uh, the point is, uh, first of all, the thing about you know the divestment of the pre salt uh, I've heard that too. I, I don't believe it's going to happen. Um, I think what the company uh, might do and what the government might understand is that they cannot offer minority stakes you know at assets held by Petrobras. They have to fully divest from some assets, you know. So at this point, I doubt many people would like to partner as a minority shareholder with Petrobras with the risk of having, you know, 
the kind of government intention we had in the past. So uh, I think what uh, 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 might happen, what might need to happen is that the government and the company will understand that they have to sell you know, the, um, some, some businesses as a whole and not only minority uh, participation. So that's one thing. And, uh, and I agree with you. I mean, uh, it might not be enough, you know, this divestment plan. We might be in the future some revision in the, if they do not succeed in the uh, uh, this if the, the, the situation worsens. Right. Well, I hate to end on such a <laughs> a down note, but I think what it really does. We always it, find a way out. Yeah. I know. I know. It's, I know. It's, uh, and I, it's, and the good thing is, well, I I think, Lavinia, are you still there? Well, unfortunately, I think we, we lost Lavinia there at the very end, but um, I really appreciate her participation and hopefully she can at least hear us and, and, and uh, thank you so much Lavinia Holanda from FGV Energia in Rio de Janeiro for sharing the analysis and results. I have to and say. Oh, you're back. Okay. We lost you for a minute. Lavinia? All right, well, Lavinia is, uh, we're, having last, we're having some last second technical difficulties. I want to thank her again and, and for sharing her time and, 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 and I want to thank everyone for joining us. This is the last webinar of 2015. So, uh, and from the sounds of it, we will need to revisit Brazil um, throughout the year next year to see exactly how some of these key issues play out in the oil sector, gas sector, and at Petrobras. So, uh, Lavinia, thank you again so much. Thank you all very much. Oh, you, you've posted on the chat. I'm sorry our audio, uh, something happened at the last minute, but better at the last minute than in the middle. Thank you all again. Thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, stay tuned as we launch the 2016 webinar series. We'll, uh, we'll be back in touch early in the new year with news and uh, specific events. And of course, it's never too early to mark your calendar for our 25th anniversary of the La Jolla Conference here, May 25th and 26th, 2016. Thank you all so much. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy new year. We'll see you online. And don't forget to uh, to follow us over the holidays at, uh, at IOA underscore dot energy. Excuse me, let me try that again. At IOA underscore energy, that's our Twitter feed. And of course, www.iamericas.org slash energy. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.